Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, a recap of the successes and failures from leaders and lobbyists of the 2020 legislative session, plus making it easier for the people who make you look good for special occasions and ending child marriage. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Lawmakers adjourned the 2020 regular legislative session, acknowledging that they will soon be returning to the state capitol. Major decisions await, including the passage of a public works package. We started, uh, you know, the session like normal session, laying out some things that we wanted to do. And number one on our list was getting a, a good infrastructure bill, a bonding bill done, and working towards some some tax relief issues and healthcare reform and all, all the things that you typically uh, work for in a session. And then COVID hit and it was like, it just, it was, it's hard to explain what kind of a wrench that threw into how we do, do legislative work. And so we dropped everything and put all our effort into COVID and we passed over $500 of resources that got into the governor's hands. He had emergency power like I don't think any governor has ever had, and all 50 governors have emergency power. So it was not anything that anybody else wasn't doing, but it just was a very, very different way to do business. Happy that we were able to get some of the things done that we had been working on. We got emergency insulin done. That was one of the issues that uh, had been around for since the prior session. Hava money needed to get passed so that uh, we had resources for our local governments in particular to you know, provide more resources for what to do uh, for, for COVID and a number of other things. Uh, there was a TCE chemical ban that got done, uh, Tobacco 21, which has been a perennial issue, uh, which we had federal conformity to. And the big issue there that I am highlighting is I think we're going to have less kids in high school and junior high vaping as a result of doing that. That was really the big issue that, that took that one over the edge. So lots of things were getting done. And then we came back to the, the bonding bill, the tax relief bill. The contracts became a, a now became an issue because of the big uh, budget shortfall. And those things didn't get done. The bonding bill is the one I'm uh, particularly disappointed in, um, that we couldn't get it done. It takes all four caucuses to agree. Uh, the, the House tried to pass a $2 billion bonding bill, and that failed the uh, Republicans there defeated it. In the Senate, we tried to pass a bonding bill, two, you know, $999 million about, that uh, the Democrats defeated. And so uh, I was surprised that the governor was calling Democrats to defeat it. I, I thought it would be better to have a position that we're trying to get one done. But uh, either way, that, that one's going into special session. And I am committed to seeing that through to the end. My disappointment that the bonding bill apparently became victim to an unrelated demand simply isn't the way to get this done. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back at it again. I will do my best um, to make the case, but I, I just want to be clear. And I hope Minnesotans are clear about this. This was the better part of six months worth of work or longer um, with very detailed with inviting the media with a scrutiny on this um, to get this done. And, and the, the courtesy to at least go through that, the courtesy to tell us why we shouldn't do that when every single economist and apparently almost every legislator is saying we should have done it um, and, and the House had it ready to go and uh, we simply couldn't get it done. So it's a shame, um, but I will not give up. In negotiations, uh, Representative Doubt never um, expressed a willingness to do a bonding bill. He has um, certain unmet conditions and so... Um, Definitely the majority leader in the Senate has spoken extensively about his desire to do a bill in the 1.3 range, but Leader Doubt has uh, largely not engaged in the bonding conversation because um, his unspecified demands um, on other unrelated topics have not been met. This is Susan Kent, and I would add um, that it was slightly different in the Senate. As you've heard, Senator Gazelka was very clear, and there have been good discussions about um, wanting to have a robust bonding bill at a, at a, at a robust level. Um, but the problem was that you can't just talk about it in the broad strokes. A bonding bill is a complex, big 
list of important local projects, and we didn't see the Senate Republicans' bill until the day before adjournment. And when we saw it, it was much smaller than the numbers that had been discussed, which if that had happened a few days earlier, maybe that would have worked out okay. But slapping together, you know, a, a, a big bonding bill at the last minute and one that does not cover the entire state adequately and fairly and does not do the um, what we need it to do in terms of delivering jobs and important projects for Minnesotans, it just it, it did not measure up to what we need to do in this time. And so I really hope that we can, at a detailed level, because there is a, a there, it's more than just talking about a number. There's a, a real collection of facts and information that go into this that have to be worked through. Accommodation of social distancing requirements prompted many historic changes to how lawmakers handle the state's business, from remote hearings to sparsely populated chambers. Lobbyists were another group impacted by the changes. Input from stakeholders is a phrase that we often hear at the Capitol, people who follow the legislature. How did COVID-19 impact lobbying? Well, it impacted it pretty dramatically. Um, and when you think of stakeholders, um, MGRC represents people who are, let me back up, MGRC is a Minnesota, Minnesota Government Relations Council, and we're a trade association of uh, dues-paying members who, for the most part, um, are uh, either primarily engaged in lobbying or have some component of their job, their profession that's lobbying, um, and folks who are registered with the campaign finance when you think of stakeholders, there's more people than that. Um, there's citizen lobbyists. There are people who show up for uh, days at the Capitol. Um, the, the folks you might see visiting legislators in their offices as part of uh, Bemidji Day comes to mind because they all wear the uh, the Yes, when everybody shirt. wears plaid, yes. <laughs> right. and, and so a lot of those things were lost and um, they're critical elements in, uh, in uh, helping educate legislators about whatever a particular issue is. Uh, beyond that, you lose the, the component of uh, the lobbyist job where we help maybe coordinate the process. You know, there are things um, that need to take place that legislators and their staff sometimes don't have time for and they rely on us. Well, so Majority Leader Gazelka said that the final days of the session felt weird. That was his quote. Mm -hmm. Due to the lack of in-person meetings, the hallway conversations, you know, there's a lot of um, ebb and flow and in the moment kinds of things like don't forget this or what about this that happened at the end. So what have you heard from other people who who hang around the Capitol? How did it affect their ability to get in touch with with lawmakers at the end? Well, I've heard a lot of frustration um, and it started even before that there were there were hearings where um, prior prior to hearings uh, the lobbyists and the legislators weren't necessarily able to have real-time communication about amendments or surprises that were coming up. Uh, and that put everyone, I think, at a disadvantage because um, current information about things that are happening on the fly uh, can lead to you know, pretty negative outcomes. And uh, same thing was true at the end of session uh, where the horse trading, uh, so to speak, was taking place at the end. Um, people like me didn't necessarily have the ability in real time to communicate with our clients and get back on what a compromise might look like, what was acceptable, what wasn't. And um, I think a lot of that impacted um, uh, not just outcomes for us, but outcomes for legislators. Um, not a lot of bills got passed, and that certainly wasn't just to do with the fact that lobbyists weren't able to participate. I don't want to overstate our role here, but um, but they do rely on us for a lot of information. Well, and, and to that point, in terms of committee meetings, uh, normally a lobbyist can just show up, you know, and get there two or three minutes at the end of a meeting on whatever topic, but you really had to be on your game. You had to be watching the agendas and you had to make sure that you let the committee administrator know that you wanted to speak and to get on the Zoom call. It was, it was maybe um, a more difficult process. Without a doubt, more difficult, um, though I have to give so much credit to the staff uh, and to the legislators who were able to pick up and run with uh, you know, what was a very clunky process um, and make it work at all. Um, and I'll grant you that the ability to just, um, uh, whereas in a smaller Zoom meeting, you can just raise your hand and interject yourself, you know, that wasn't a possibility. And um, for those of us who had uh, more sophisticated understanding of the process, 
we were able to get involved. Uh, but for people um, that do government relations as a small portion of their job or perhaps citizens, it was really difficult. Now, is there a silver lining here at all? I mean, we've all gotten a lot better at technology and communicating in, in ways that we wouldn't mm -hmm. normally communicate. Granted, our preference is always in person, or for many of us, for me, in person. But is there a silver lining here any, anywhere? Beyond how nice my yard looks, um, in this <laughs> line of work, you simply don't get springtime to do any kind of work. Um, I, no, the silver lining, I think, is that um, there are times where, for whatever reason, uh, expense, uh, personal difficulty, or whatever the case may be, an expert might not be able to get in front of a committee. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future, this technology will help to bring more relevant experts uh, to the legislature. Um, I happen to believe that uh, the more educated a legislator can be, the, the better outcomes uh, we might experience. So um, I'm hopeful that the comfort and the familiarity we developed during the crisis with technology uh, will help the process in the future. Jeremy Essenson, I wanna thank you for your time. Thank you very much. the last few years, the people who make brides and prom goers look their best for that special day have been faced with extensive education requirements or high fines in order to continue operating their businesses. That may be about to change. Your bill to exempt hair and makeup artists from licensing requirements has passed the House and the Senate. Presumably Governor Walls will sign it into law. What brought this issue to your attention? Uh, thanks for having me, Shannon. It was a constituent of mine, uh, Christina in Stillwater who does hair and makeup for special events, a, a prom or say a bride for her wedding or the whole wedding party. And she came to me and she was really upset because the Board of Cosmetology started fining these, these hair and makeup artists. There are over a thousand of them in the, in the state of Minnesota. And the Board of Cosmetology started fining them and sending them warnings saying, if you don't get a full on cosmetology license, which is thousands and thousands of hours and get a salon manager's license, um, you are not allowed to practice your business anymore. So you have all of these, mostly women own these businesses, uh, freaking out. A couple of them even did go out of business because they got fined by the Board of Cosmetology. And they just want to continue to do what they've always been doing, but the board decided to change their rules and it was affecting all of these small business owners. Now, as you mentioned, um, it, it's been a rule change or a change in interpretation, but it said that hair and makeup artists needed to have cosmetology or esthetician licenses, salon managers licenses, and special event permits. So do you know why there was the sudden change in interpretation or an in, in enforcement of this? And, and we're still trying to figure that out. Where did that come from? Or was it just the Board of Cosmetology needed to get more fees and so they were going to get it from, from these folks? Uh, because it really, they really are two separate businesses. They only do hair and makeup. They don't cut, they don't color, they don't do nails. Uh, as a matter of fact, even if you're gonna get your full-on cosmetology license in those thousands of hours, there's makeup is barely addressed in, in those hours of learning. So they, these women just wanted to focus on that. and for for the board to out of nowhere randomly these these rules have been in place for decades for them just to randomly change it up and say oh now we're going to interpret it this way and so you you women can't do your businesses any longer because we've changed our mind so i have no idea where it came from we've been asking gina fax the fast the director of the board of cosmetology and she doesn't answer so upon enactment then um how much training would a person who wants to do hair and makeup just for weddings or proms or other events like that, what kind of training do they need? Uh, we put into the bill that they have to have a four hour state certified class of sanitation because they'll have their makeup brushes or their combs or brushes. Um, so they have to have a sanitation class to make sure that, that their, their tools are clean. But that's pretty much it. There are schools out there like Faces Etc. that does teach uh, makeup. And I apologize, I'm at the lake here and somebody's doing work, somebody's building their cabin. Uh, there, are, there are places like Faces that teach makeup and so if you if you go to that school you can carry that certificate around but most of these these women owned businesses are just word of mouth uh, you know my my cousin had so and so at her wedding and did their makeup and hair and she did a great job here are the pictures that's how they that's how they get their businesses going
So in a sense, maybe there is a growing understanding that in terms of cosmetology, there's really a lot of different um, ways to handle it. There is simply just hair and makeup, or there's cut and color, or there's nails, or whatever, and that this our state laws need to address the different levels of work that people do and the requirements that are necessary. Is that is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And and these women actually didn't want that kind of a license. They didn't want to work in a salon. They didn't want to cut people's hair. They didn't want to color. And all of those women at, at my salon in Woodbury. They did want to do that. So they did get that license. And, and that license, it takes a lot, like 5,000 hours of schooling, and it costs them anywhere from ten to $20,000. So these, these small, really small hair and makeup freelance artists just want to do uh, makeup and hair for, for special events. They don't want to, and it's mostly stay-at-home moms that this is, this is the money that they help to put their kids in through soccer or hockey or food on the table. They, they, and they couldn't afford to do the full-on license either. So... Um, there, there are different levels of licensing, and this is, this is one that just needs four hours of sanitation. Senator Karen Housley, thank you. Thanks, Shannon. We'll see you soon. Child marriage is defined as marriage before the age of 18, and a United Nations initiative seeks to end the practice globally over the next 10 years. In Minnesota, that goal has been accomplished. Minnesota is only the fourth state, Pennsylvania beat us by four days, that will ban marriage before the age of 18. Does this indicate a pervasive point of view that marriage for minors is appropriate? Well, I think it's just a hangover from begone days, you know, our grandparents' time when there wasn't much of, of a teenagehood for young people and that, that was their choice is they, you know, young men were apprenticed and they got, job, they got jobs young and young women were really trained to run the farm or run the household and uh, that's all there was. Nowadays, so many people don't get married or they get married in their late 20s, early 30s. And so I just think that people don't think about it so much because they don't think it's happening because it's, it's still pretty rare, especially in Minnesota. We don't actually know the number of, uh, cause we don't keep track. Um, but, uh, that's why I just think people are surprised to find out that we allow, um, children to get married. I did read a statistic that across the nation uh, between 2000 and 2010, they estimate about 250,000 minors are getting married. There are a patchwork of laws across states that deal with marriage. In some states, children as young as 12 can still get married. Um, last year in Idaho, they had a bill that would have banned marriage before the age of 16, judicial parental consent for 16, 17 year olds, and that bill failed in Idaho. So what does it tell you about Minnesota that in both the House and the Senate, this bill passed unanimously? I think it, it says what I said before is that people didn't realize that we actually allowed it for under age 18. And when, when they think back to their children or themselves, they really recognize that uh, children are really not prepared for marriage. That being said, um, it did take me a while to convince people that we shouldn't still allow the exceptions. Because remember, current law allows 16 and 17 year olds to marry with their parents' permission and with judges' approval, but it doesn't give any guidance for judges. So, um, I mean, there were people who still, still feel that if a girl gets pregnant, it's better for her to be married. And yet we know the high domestic abuse rate and the divorce rate is very high. And actually, uh, children under the age of 18 can't get divorced. So, that, so we were in a situation where they could get married, but they couldn't get out of the marriage. Um, and also, I think that there were still some people who had kind of a romantic notion. I mean, someone once said to me, why should I interfere with a Romeo and Juliet marriage? And I took a pause and I said, well, how'd that end up? How did that end up? You know, they both end up dead at the end of the play. So it wasn't a very good example at all. Uh, child marriage is not only happening in the United States, but also around the globe. The advocacy group Unchained at, La at Last was instrumental in getting this legislation uh, through the state of Minnesota's legislature. Mm -hmm. What did they do right? Well, there's really two questions. The age of 18 around the globe um, for marriage is really becoming the standard. 
And the United Nations certainly supports that and international health groups support that because young girls who get married that young do face a lot of health challenges, including impacted pregnancies and, and a lot of later health, uh, health issues. Um, the work of, your other question is the work of Unchained. Um, I think they did what any good advocacy group did, uh, does. They um, contacted uh, their members to, um, to call the committee. They flew out here from New Jersey and we did a, a fantastic press conference with young girls wearing bridal dresses, you know, um, like girls, not brides, and uh, with chains on their, on their arms, on their, on their wrists. And, um, and they did individual lobbying. Um, and the fact that it was really a, a national movement, they had all the statistics, all the data on their website available for us to use. So they were extremely helpful. So the governor did sign this bill on August 1st, then uh, anyone under the age of 18 will not be allowed to get married in Minnesota. Um, and this is in part due to your efforts and who was your partner in the house on this? I'm glad you brought up Kaylee Herr, Representative Kaylee Herr, and the fact that personal stories also make, uh, make a difference. And Kaylee spoke very eloquently about um, when she was a teenager and an older man approached her father uh, because it was cult that was culturally appropriate at one point in her, in her Hmong community. And her father just said, go away. My daughter's going to college and she's gonna get married when she's good and ready. And so he was very supportive of her and that really kind of helped or go against the tradition of her community. So those personal stories, the head of Unchained at last was in a forced marriage at age 19. Those are also very persuasive. We had a number of Minnesota women who had talked about, um, you know, um, her, uh, her husband-to-be driving to another state, which we don't allow in this uh, legislation, uh, until they found, and judge shopping, until they found someone that would marry her at the age of 14. So this is, this is a good bill. Uh, Senator Sandy Pappas, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. All right, stay home, stay safe. The 2020 legislative session began just like any other session with lawmakers and citizens congregating for their causes. And then it became something never witnessed before. Here's a collection of images in order, taken by our Senate photographers, David Oakes and A.J. Olmscheid.
Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.